I'd like to introduce Professor Nick Lennox. He's a long-term director and professor for the University of Queensland, Queensland Centre for Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. It's based in the Mater Hospital and that's in Brisbane. He's provided physical and mental health care to adults with developmental disabilities over a 28 year period in Melbourne and Brisbane. Nick has led innovations in education and applied research which has changed healthcare delivery and education across the globe. He feels passionately about improving the health and healthcare of people with developmental disabilities, especially when this is driven by empowering adults with a disability, their families and supporters and healthcare providers. Since ceasing clinical practice in 2018, he has continued to work in the area areas of advocacy and educational research. Most recently, Nick has appeared as an expert witness in the Disability Royal Commission and was asked in April 2020 to take on a role as a medical advisor to the Federal Health Department on COVID-19 and people with a disability. So we're very fortunate to have him here today. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Nick to do his presentation. All right, thank, thanks, Sam. Thanks for the uh, introduction. Um, and uh, thank you for allowing me to this opportunity to talk to people about the uh, the health of people with disabilities, um, which um, is a really a profoundly important issue. Um, so I'm very much coming from the position of having been trained in general practice and worked, uh, also trained a little bit in psychiatry and indeed in obstetrics for a while um, and other bits and pieces. And but then applying that knowledge and looking at the, the area of disability and particularly intellectual disability over the last 30 years and and kind of taking a step and having a different view, I guess, than that is typical from the disability community because they're quite different and uh, have different paradigms. Health and disability have massively different paradigms. Um, so I this presentation, I'll, I'll start up in a minute, but I just wanted to say we're going to have a couple of breaks um, we will be, I'll, I'm going to ask you to stand up and have a stretch and um, and uh, ask questions. I also want you to actively collect in your mind ways which, particularly the second or the second two thirds of this presentation, how you can, how that might alter your practice in the way that you educate people to provide support. Because there is real problems with support at the moment and support workers a place a very complex position to a place to work in and are often disempowered themselves but often poor you know not well trained um and they're transient there's a huge transient population um, and we could talk about that for, i have to say when i first came to queensland to set up the center from melbourne um i did a presentation and uh, on that presentation the uh I had made three different types of presentations, including overhead projector, which some of you will remember from days have gone by. And the slide projector caught fire, and then the overhead projector died. <laughs> so, that does, that prepare. was a long time ago, Nick, overhead projectors. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's some people with grey hair on this call, so they probably remember. Um, anyway, so we're going to talk about health and well-being, health and well-being of people with disabilities broadly, and what we know and how to improve the situation. Um, and uh, I'd first like to acknowledge the, uh, uh, the uh, Indigenous people of the, of the land that you're on and I'm on. I'm on the land of the uh, Jagger and Turrbal people, which is basically known as, we now think of as Brisbane, um, and I'm out to the west there, and acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. Um, and also anybody of Indigenous origin that work in the area and uh, you know, one of the first things I saw at the uh, Royal Commission, there was an analysis looking how uh, various aspects double your risk of a whole bunch of things. So if you add indig indigeneity to disability, then your risks of a whole bad outcomes increase um, substantially twofold. Um, and that's true of the situation now. I'd also like to acknowledge that what a lot of this has actually been drawn for people with disabilities and their families and supporters like yourself and the people that are working there and various government agencies over the days. And uh, and thanks to Bev and Sam for organising this. It's uh, very exciting to be able to present to you guys. What I'm going to talk about is the context because um, context is all, and I, I think this is a kind of an axiom of life, actually. Um, 
And many of you who may not have heard, one of the leading researchers in the world is a guy called Eric Emerson. And I interviewed him for a massive open online course many years ago. And, uh, well, not that many years ago, six years ago. And Eric, I asked him, what would you, what your advice would you, what's your advice to people with disabilities? His first advice was be born to a rich family. Because context, socioeconomic context, major huge difference, as do a whole bunch of things. And the, the banner to this slide, you can see this is um, uh, Julianne Colville, who was born to Marg Colville and Jim Colville, who is a friend of mine. I used to work with them. And Julianne was born with Down syndrome. And you can see this is the course of her life. She, her best friend was her sister's. She's hanging out with her sister's friend. She's a bridesmaid but never a bride. And she's at a party here farewelling family as they leave home. The context, she had a very good context. She's still dad and her are still alive and going and getting on well. Though Jim's in his 80s, I think now. Um, and she's got family around her. But that's a very different circumstance to many other people. So it really does dictate a hell of a lot. I'm going to talk about health status of the different populations, intellectual disability, autism and high support needs. And the reason I've picked those groups are because the people that you're teaching are actually often providing, providing support to these groups. Um, and so I think that's, that's where the sort of focus should be. And each, has, each individual has unique needs, but there's also differences, I think, also if you've got an intellectual disability than having a high support needs, but having great cognitive function. They're quite a different scenario. Then I'm going to talk about the pragmatics. So some background and the pragmatics of monitoring health and well-being for people with disability. And and also some of the uh, strategies um, can be used. As uh, Sam said, I, I started working for the federal government um, in uh, February last year, uh, no, sorry, April last year, because of the pandemic and the, also because we were rolling out a national roadmap to improve the health of people with intellectual disability. And that is something I've been advocating for years. And um, so, I've been involved in some of the pandemic planning nationally. So if you've got questions about pandemic and beyond, uh, then I'm um, happy to try to talk to those if that's useful when we get down the track. And then I'll just have to do that. Okay, so we're talking about a lot of Australians who've got a disability, 4.4 million Australians, and 1.4 million or 5.7% of the population have a severe or profound disability and the definition is there sometimes or always needing help in daily self-care mobility and communication activities. It's a big population of people out there. And as you will probably intuitively know, is that as you get older, your chances of having a disability of consequence increase. And um, and I always like the term noddies that was used during the campaign to get the NDIS up, which was not disabled yet because it can occur to anybody at any time. And certainly as you get older, that becomes readily apparent to you. Um, so in the pandemic, there was quite interesting because we, the I'm on the, Fed, the federal but also the Queensland Advisory Panel, and so we had to look at who's there and because we knew people with disabilities at risk. Now, I, I knew, it just wasn't a surprise to me, but it was certainly, I think, a little bit of a surprise to the public health people that we really didn't have, you know, we've got a lot of Queensland with a disability, a million, 300,000 were found to be this week, 79,000 on uh, NDIS, NDIS participants. But look at this one, unknown number of people living in disability accommodation was the situation. And if you've got an at-risk population, I remember one particular meeting in the advisory panel in New South Wales was the public health people were being horrified when they realised that they, that when there was an outbreak occurring in one part of Sydney, that they couldn't actually put the finger on where everybody at risk was, because uh, they could do that for the elderly pretty much, but they couldn't do it for people with disabilities. And data is a major problem, but that's beyond this one. So disability accommodation support array is in a various settings, uh, short-term respite, state-run extended care facilities, um, home, and this is the you know the homes of four or five people in the community, or just one person being, getting support. And then there's a whole population in special accommodations or boarding houses, many of which also have a disability. So there's a huge, and this is a, a not well-regulated part of the community. Um, and it's been a concern. In fact, we did a, a review of the deaths in care 
that was tabled in Parliament in 2016 and found many, many conditions, preventable deaths. Um, I can't remember the exact number, but it was something like uh, something like over 50% uh, we thought uh, were possibly preventable and, and of a third of those, I think, were almost certainly preventable had we had uh, other systems in place. And there was problems particularly with swallowing, things like that, but and epilepsy management and health assessments, things like that. So, you know, this is not an unknown, this is Queensland, this is now that we've got these problems. When you when you work in this area, as you guys have, I think, for a long period of time, you just kind of, why is this such a, why is this population so devalued? And, um, and it's been apparent, on, you can go through, there's a long history of discrimination, including uh, the development of a lot of eugenics, uh, supported by Sir Francis, it should be, I've missed the S off there, uh, Bacon. And, um, and this was based on research where Goddard, a psychologist who tried to establish a link between low morality and intellectual disability or feeble-mindedness. And that uh, links so uh, um, poor use of, uh, yeah, it was actually, it was really bad, bad science, but he did that and it was convinced that, and that's actually what that book was republished by the Nazis and led them to exterminate um, uh, 125,000 estimated people with intellectual disability and other what they described as useless eaters during the Nazi period. There's been a reaction, obviously, for the UN Charter and more recently the UN Convention on the Rights of People with a Disability. But still, this issue. So there's this profound devaluing in this population. And to work in this, to work in this area is to, is to take the responsibility to challenge others, to look at their own unconscious bias in this regard. And that's absolutely there. It's, it's there in me. It's, uh, we react to people who look different. We react to things that are, indifferent, are different in our environment. And it's a very protective thing to do that because you pick up maybe the saber-toothed tiger is about to bite you, but it also can mean you can react in a negative way when something's different and not actually pause, reflect, and take appropriate action with, res with respect to that person. And it's all, yeah, so anyway, so, and, and it continues on. Um, and to me, this is about the psychology of othering. Um, we other groups, and indeed people say you, be, you may, um, you know, that, um, that, that we want to alienate other groups and then devalue them as a person. And the consequence of this process, so we might do it with any group, so somebody who breaks with a different football team, uh, for example, I break for Essendon, who's have had a dodgy career, but done this recently. But everybody poo poos Collingwood fans in AFL world, and I believe the same is true of Manly. This is kind of they are like this, and we homogenise them as one group. Um, uh, so this is done on people with different sexual orientation or even political beliefs. Uh, greenies are, Trump supporters are. They have these cluster beliefs, and essentially, we're trying to depersonalise, distant these people from us, and actually. This process has been used in war propaganda and in politics, really, to, to elicit fear and also negative responses. So the othering process is profound for people with intellectual disability and needs to be acknowledged up front. Okay, so in that context, I just wanted to run through some of the issues around health status. Um, I know the three groups I've said to you are the adults with intellectual disability, people with autism, or autism spectrum disorder, people with high support needs, and just give you some insights into that. A recent um, AIHW report on mortality showed that people with disabilities that uh, were 4.7 times more likely to die compared to the general population in the under age, 65 age group. So if you take the same 100,000 people um, and, and then the death rate for people with disability, about 60, 650 compared to 130. It's a massive difference. Um, and so there is distinctly a lot of work to be done in this area. If we just look at people with intellectual disability, they also have this very early death. Um, they often suffer, if you look at it very, you know, not by looking at the broad literature over many, many years, but also even the recent literature, and, and the recent literature in Queensland is actually work that I've done in some of the work on health assessments, 
it clearly shows high levels of unrecognized and poorly managed conditions. So there's a the the all, you know the basically people are more likely to miss depression, more likely to miss um, diabetes, more likely to miss a whole bunch of things. There's a lack of health screening. They don't get health screening, and that they just and there's lack of health promotion or even access to opportunities to have wellness in their life. And I'll come to why some of the strategies to improve this. This is made worse by the contextual issues of isolation, lack of social engagement and relationship. In fact, isolation is seen as a major contributor to things as as raw as people die from heart disease. Um, and People don't think of those ways, but that's, it has a profound low, um, effect on people's health. There's a thing called social capital, which is um, uh, Putman described, where if you know people in your, the more connected you are, for example, do you know the first name of your neighbours, um, the less likely you're likely to, you, you have better health out, outcomes, measurable health outcomes, the more connected you are. And this is also a problem can be a problem for people with disabilities and many other people, but particularly people with intellectual disabilities. If we just go through the unmet health needs, and I guess this is where this is where I've spent you know, 20, 28 years of my life practising medicine in specifically in people with intellectual disability, you often see unrecognised physical pain. Dental's really common, and that man's teeth is not a surprise to me I've seen many people that are like that. And in fact, uh, he's probably got reflux, and I can tell that because it's very hard to burn out those bottom teeth like he's got burnt out. He's almost certainly in a wheelchair would be my guess, and I don't know because I just got it off the web, and he's got reflux esophagitis just on looking at that. And that's because of the, the nature of that planet. But commonly, not specifically that type of dental care. You know, I have missed people with autism with dental abscesses and I just didn't pick it up and then it became obvious. So dental pain is often missed. Musculoskeletal pain is, is also commonly missed. There's a, down the bottom there, you can see a broken elbow. Um, I'll just point to the, if you feel a knob on the end of your elbow, it's, this bit here has been broken off from here. This bit here has been broken too. That's the pointy end of your elbow. It's got the wonderful name of, name of the electron on, which I have no idea where it's got to call the electron on, but that's what it's called. Um, and your funny bone, yes, is right next door. Um, anyway, you'd have to go smash and smash your arm down to, to break that off. That went undiagnosed for two weeks uh, in a cold climate, somebody in a residence um, where people were really not observing and looking and thinking and taking, looking at the obvious things. And so... And indeed, when I, I presented to Cairns earlier today and when I was, well, not last time I was in Cairns, but I did go up to Cairns and I saw a man who, in a house, and I merely took, got him to be unclothed, to lift up his, his legs and there was a fractured leg that was undiagnosed. That seems ridiculous, but the leg was, I didn't know it was fractured, but it was just black with blood. And... Uh, it was eventually diagnosed as fractured. So missing things that are simple happens, and it happens much too frequently. Gut problems, and I'll talk about that as well, are causes of physical pain. Mental disorders, um, it certainly are very common, whether you call these diagnosable mental Ill, um, disorders or psychological disorders, is kind of there's a whole debate around this, but Certainly depression and I think post-traumatic stress disorder and the research would suggest schizophrenia are much more common in this population. Why so, say, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, if I can say it, um, is more common is because people often in traumatised in early childhood are often traumatised going into the medical systems, often abused. In fact, uh, there is there was a report about domestic violence and disability that came out yesterday and identified people with disabilities at twice the risk of the general population. And when you consider the amount of domestic violence that's currently happening, that's, that's terrifying. It's unsurprising to me. We often see people being abused in houses by co-residents and by other people. Um, and so um, post-traumatic stress disorder is a consequence of that and often hard to diagnose. Although, you know, we clinically, we and um, we would see people incredibly distressed and agitated and if we couldn't work out another cause, we often thought, and particularly if they couldn't tell us what was going on, 
were highly suspicious that was happening. And and staff cover this up. Um, and I should point out too that this is not just residents on residence. This is staff on residence. This is family on on participants or people with intellectual disability. This is doctors on people with intellectual disability. And I've seen that now twice in the time in, during my practice. Um, in fact, a neurologist in Melbourne took his own life after it was discovered to have been sexually abusing clients um, for a number of years. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so, you know, predators, sexual predators, are, it's, not, it's not about socioeconomic position. <laughs> Uh, in fact, power, as we've seen with the American guy, whose name I've just forgotten, um, you know, increases your risk, uh, the risk of it, I reckon. So abuse is very common and, um, and uh, in this population. Medications is a big issue. And uh, when I spoke this morning, it was right, the use, this was a, a huge issue, and the use of neuroleptics or psychotropics or major tranquilizers, which are the, the drugs that are to, to sedate people, is much more than it should be. The figures range 40, 40% up to 40% of people with adults with intellectual disability on these medications. And then the other medications like use of antidepressants and other medications. The typical drug currently is risperidone that's used, but there's a number of other uh, um, neuroantipsychotics that are used in this context. This is a huge complex issue. It would take me hours to talk about this. It, there is no single solution to this. The solution probably lies in partly in people questioning, 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 and be prepared to decrease the medication and tr see how things go where they exist and try to do as much as you can to avoid people getting on especially if there's no clear-cut psychiatric diagnosis. And as I said to you, one of the risperidone is sometimes used for post-traumatic stress disorder as it, and also for psychosis. So sometimes diagnostically, it is actually very, can be very difficult. Um, um, I worked uh, the current head of the centre I used to head um, and now the centre, the clinical, well, the centre has been rebadged as MIDAS, the MARTA Intellectual Disability and Autism Service, is headed by... Kathy Franklin, who's an extraordinarily good psychiatrist. <laughs> um, and uh, I remember talking to Kathy one day when she assessed somebody I'd seen. She said, you know, I, I think this, 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 and gave a formulation of mental health. And it almost certainly is bipolar affective disorder is what she said. And I, I looked at her across the table and I said, it most certainly is, because there's always this uncertainty. She provides, I really, she's one of the best psychiatrists I've ever come across. Um, so... That was the highest level, but even so, there's uncertainty um, in, in making psychiatric diagnosis. You I mean the reality of a psychiatric diagnosis is it actually requires a detailed story of the person's, in its best form, of the person's subjective experience of being, and that's sometimes not always accessible. And when you're starting making leaps from behaviour, then your uncertainty goes up. So anyway. I could, we can talk if we get a chance to more about uh, medications and psychiatric disorders. Any convulsions, 20% of this population have uh, epilepsy or one of the epilepsies and often have a number of epilepsies because there's different types of epilepsy. Um, and therefore, they're often on anticonvulsants. Anticonvulsants uh, uh, have side effects. We're dealing with populations that often can't report side effects, including strange things like double vision, blurred vision, sedation, um, dry mouth, uh, feeling zonked out, um, and they interact with each other as well. So it's really complex managing this uh, use of anticonvulsants, particularly because we know we don't want people to have fits. Fits are very dangerous for you. And... Uh, you need to be able to get on control of the fits, but you, you have this constant balance between controlling the seizures and actually not making people too sedated at the same time. A really complex mixture of, uh, of things. So epilepsy is often overdiagnosed, but it was also underdiagnosed. And I remember a consultation where I sat there with the father saying to a young woman, stop that, stop that, and she was actually having a what's called a complex partial fit, but he didn't recognise it as a seizure. Um, so it's, it's difficult, it's challenging. 
at one of the key things is you need good quality review. You need people to actually commit to gradually decreasing medication. And I'll talk about Peter, who's sitting there smiling at you and his sister, uh, who we did this with. We actually, he started our first for him and he had uh, four medications. And he had complex epilepsy. And we decreased his medication very slowly uh, using a chart, which I'll show you. Over a couple of years, now he's on two medications at about less than half the original dose by taking it slowly, gently, not being, um, yeah. And it was, I do, the last last time I remember seeing people was when this, Peter was, when they said to me, oh, Peter's really pretty damn assertive these days. And I said, oh, that's a good thing. He must be waking up. Um, that's what it was a good thing. Anyway, infections are also common in this population and missing infections can be easily done. You may or may not know that women have very, you know, often have urinary tract infections. And so those things are definitely at risk, particularly people in wheelchairs uh, with mobility issues. But missed flu infections, and I've seen a couple of cases where quite significant infections have occurred, but we haven't picked up or the support haven't picked up because the person doesn't communicate that well, particularly with people with autism spectrum disorder. Okay. The other health needs is health promotion to disease prevention, which is largely not that done, done in this population, and there's some real issues around that. And also addressing environmental uh, lifestyle problems, sorry, such as obesity. And indeed, Helen Bange is uh, one of the major researchers. She's now the same, she's the same age as the Queen now, Helen, and she did some major reviews demonstrating um, 5.4 uh, conditions per person with an intellectual disability, half of which were poorly managed. Or, and they uh, were poorly managed. Um, and this was research done in the North Shore of Sydney, um, and, which is a rich suburb, and uh, found huge neglect. And she actually saw somebody who had scurvy during her career uh, because of poor diet. Obesity is very common, even commoner than the Australian population, which has got a front of the uh, second, I think we're second in the world now. Um, and needs to be addressed. Osteoporosis, particularly in Down syndrome, and vitamin D deficiency is common, as is sensory impairment. Not hearing and seeing something makes your ability to learn, um, impairs your ability to learn. Um, and we don't check people's ears. And I know from the, the health reviews, that the health assessments we did across Queensland, that over 50% people had wax in their ears and they couldn't, simple thing, and they couldn't hear. There's lots of other reasons, such as neurosensory losses. And we just don't check in adult work, and we need to check, because particularly if you've got an intellectual disability, learning and understanding your environment is crucial. Gut problems are really common, uh, constipation particularly, and uh, um, as I, um, I, you know, it's, this, um, that is a large amount of faeces, in somebody's pelvis, that's the hip bones there, and that's the pelvis. Um, just and see, so you can imagine what that would feel like, and how problematic that would be. Constipation, and there's some recent studies, particularly in the Netherlands, looking at this. Very common in people with severe intellectual disability. Up to seventy percent was the figure they got from uh, Bornheimer get from her studies. Really problem, and as I as I do say, these presentations are a bit disturbing. But you know, I actually saw somebody, or I had a patient who was admitted to ICU vomiting feces because they were so severely constipated. It also leads to the bowel getting really big. So you normally your bowels kind of, you know, hand size kind of and muscular with thick walls. But if you have chronic constipation, you get a big floppy bowel that can twist on itself. It's got a fancy name. It's called volvulus and it can kill the person. And we know that that's more problem common in this population. So bowel monitoring, I will go on about bowel monitoring bowels a lot. Um, there's a bug called Helicobacter pylori. Um, and this was an Australian discovery in Western Australia by um, Barnard, Barnard and Co. on a Nobel Prize, found that this bug actually was in the stomach and caused ulcers. More common in people have been institutionalized and treatable. Uh, and reflux of acid up from the stomach, and there's the diaphragm goes across here. Oh, not that. No, go back. <laughs> um, the diaphragm goes across here, and there's a valve there, and there's battery acid in here, and this is the same lining as your as your mouth. So if you burn it, burn it, burn it a lot, um, then you can get ulcers, reflux, esophagitis, 
reflux being going backwards, and you can get a pain as, as a consequence of that. So there's now treatments uh, for reflux, and it's particularly common in people with cerebral palsy that are in chair, wheelchairs, but anybody that's got musculoskeletal and spasm, it's more likely, and I won't go into why, but it's more likely, because I guess it's because of nerve cell migration as much as anything. Um, urogenital problems, so under Cindy's testes are really common and dangerous. If your testes don't descend and don't go into the scrotum, they end up one degree warmer, and this has increases your cancer rate by 400-fold. So they need to get into the scrotum or be removed. Um, and it's not picked up in this population, and we found a number in our studies that we did, as is low testicular and gonadal function, seemingly more common. Uh, well, okay, that's all the difficult medical stuff we can just... The other unmet need is that in childhood, we often diagnose things, and these are a couple of kids with what's called fragile X syndrome, and that's the uh, fragile side on the X chromosome or there that I'm pointing to, um, the most inherited, common, common inherited form of intellectual disability, now increasingly picked up and really quite a significant thing in terms of the family and the person and their life. But we need to revisit this issue um, as people get older. And indeed, this is a brain scan of somebody I saw who is 33, had an intellectual disability, and there's this black part in her brain which the clever radiologist could tell me was because that had a, she'd had a bleed as a fetus in the brain. It was just a spontaneous thing that occurred. He explained both her intellectual disability and also said, and her epilepsy, and also said to her sisters and brothers, you're not at any greater risk of having a child with a disability than everybody else. So it can be quite significant both for the family, but also um, I diagnosed Rett syndrome in a, in a woman who was in her late 30s, I think at the time, and her mother sighed at relief. She was an alternative medicine practitioner, said to me, oh, Nick, that's great. Um, you know, it wasn't that glass of alcohol I had biased while I was pregnant. She'd been holding this for years. And also it empowered her to then to understand why things were happening in her daughter's life, uh, particularly around um, reflux, uh, particularly around spasticity and, and muscle pain, because she could look at what other people experienced in the situation, which is really, really, really useful. Now, I just wanted to talk about autism because autism has changed over the last 40 years. We're talking about a prevalence of 1 in 70 to 100 of the general population. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a great topic of discussion <laughs> as to why this has happened, and I've got my own theories, but it's all theories, and certainly definition has changed. Um, uh, and so I think recognition has changed, particularly um, the milder forms of or milder forms of autism where there is an intellectual disability that people are being picked up and realising it's real, that it's had a profound effect on their life. It's one of the interesting areas for me where with the, I've actually been in a number of situations where a diagnosis of autism and particularly Asperger's, what's called Asperger's, or um, was made. And it suddenly made sense to people as to why their life has happened the way it's happened. And these are adults in their later in life or why their partner. I've had kind of conversations where they say, my God, I now understand my husband why he is the way he is because of this and it makes sense to me and fits. So diagnostically, it can be quite useful, interestingly useful. In fact, I have to say, I have never come across a circumstance where that actually wasn't a useful insight for the person uh, when they're able to talk about the impact. Um, because some, sometimes things start to make a bit more sense and there's a community available to you. Um, there's various health risks, I think, for people with autism according to their um, uh, disability, the, their functional capacity, let's say. Um, and th but there's almost, there is increased major psychiatric problems, anxiety in particular, um, social anxiety, depression, uh, suicide are quite common. There's also a range of medical conditions from, I think it's about 15% have a lot of immune conditions, gastro, stomach problems, sleep disorders, sleep is often a real problem for people. Um, dyslipidemia just means uh, not good lipid fats, blood flats, obesity, hypertension and diabetes. And this is a relatively recent, largest study around from Cohen in uh, California. If you look at people with high support needs, but not a cognitive, because some people with high support needs have a cognitive disability as well, 
there is also a bunch of health conditions and, and health risks for this population. And again, the people you're teaching are going to be providing in-home support for many people, um, such as constipation, reflux esophagitis, which I've mentioned before. And sometimes the acid coming up the, the gut and into the mouth can go into the lungs and cause pneumonia, cause aspiration pneumonia. Spasticity causes pain, distress, um, and it can be a real problem and difficult to manage. And of course, skin problems, particularly around pressure areas, but not only. Um, um, yeah. There's also, again, issues around uh, isolation, devaluing, exploitation and violence and significant mental health risks. And I'll just uh, pop in a couple of references there. Um, and you, which I should have said to you before, you're getting a copy of these slides um, in your inbox in a short time. Okay, so I'm going to talk about monitoring health and well-being and pragmatic solutions. And, I, and while I'm doing that, I'll just check my watch. Okay. So way, the way I've constructed this is to think about if I'm a support worker and what I've, I've in this first part of what I've got power over doing because, I mean, you guys know because you're teachers, <laughs> you know, uh, we have limited power to change our students' behaviour, but maybe if we can inhabit their space and walk them through the things that they can do, and it, I think is really useful. And um, so I've tried to imagine if I was the support worker because clearly my head is in the medical stuff because I know the medical stuff very well. But if I, if I try to extract myself from that and think about what is doable, now some of it's... Um, uh, so firstly, the first thing is looking at the well-being. Let's wind back from the biophysical kind of medical stuff. There's a whole lot of identifiable managed risk tobacco. Actually, people with intellectual disability but don't smoke that much, but a lot of other people do and support staff do. It is a big killer, <laughs> along with alcohol, and I haven't even put alcohol in there, but uh, people with disabilities don't generally. But like, gee, why didn't I put alcohol? It's funny, isn't it? Um, they're also a big killer of people and it causes a lot of damage. Weight is a real problem and there's no easy solution. Um, and I know this from personal experience. I used to be 30 kilograms heavier than I am now. So I know this challenge having gone up and down in weight over many years. And it, you can, you need to have really a, a bit, well, there's, that's a whole talk on its own, but weight's an issue. Exercise is an issue. Isolation is an issue, particularly around mental health, and being made massively worse by the pandemic. And I think when I thought about this, the other thing that support workers need to go is that people, um, what is really apparent, particularly people with cognitive uh, disabilities, is they need predictability in their environment. And anything that dislocates that predictability is really toxic and, and causes and can also lead to, yeah, and that includes poor communication. So these are things that are in the background that maybe there's things, and when I think about this, the, the taking action things you can do is go for a walk around the corner, for God's sake. Exercise is one of the most profoundly good strategies for preventing mental health problems, physical health problems, and, uh, and uh, is something, some and just, Minimal increases in exercise has a profound effect on people's well-being. Um, and, you know, it's one of the few things that exercise associated with decreasing dementia. There's not much out there <laughs> to do that. Um, so you can't emphasise it. It sounds boring kind of day-to-day, -day, but actually we should think about it. The other thing that's very striking and I've alluded to is the day-to-day -day monitoring. The support workers, and particularly if they've got people with communication, major communication issues in houses, they need to monitor and record stuff. And even if you've got a problem, whether it's your bowels, or if you've got fits, certainly, um, behaviour, mood, or your menstrual cycle, it is really useful to record it so you know the hell and try to work out when there's a problem um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'll show you some ways of doing this. Um, I'll show you some tools that we've developed to do that as well. And so charting it is essential. And this is an example, and in fact, I used this on Peter, um, so that so you can record the fit type under A, B, C, and D at the top of the thing there, 
and then you can adjust and insert very directly what, what fit type occurred over the course of the day. Now, this won't work for everybody, but it means that if I'm a doctor and I'm gradually changing medications, I can get an overall view of my effectiveness. And also, I've got time to look at this. I haven't got a lot of time to look at a whole bunch of files that are there. So just kind of, I mean, I just made this up myself, but, you know, <laughs> I've used it for years. Simple things that staff can do to get make this thing accessible and pragmatic things you can do. And bowel charting is the other one. And um, it's really important. Um, the other thing uh, that I, monitoring health, is it occurred to me one of the, one of the, the profound things you hear in this area is you see families particularly, but not only, but mainly families who are supporting somebody who needs a lot of support, and they exquisitely under, understand their child's needs. Um, you know, I've, I've got four children, and, you know, you, you um, when they're little, you're the advocate for them, and you're the one who knows that little Johnny does this, but... Lucy does this, and, and they are whole different individuals. And that's really true of this amazing, this amazing group of parents who are really onto it and can tell you if they do this, this means that. And, and I do say to doctors, you've got to listen to them. Don't ignore them. These people know them. They're the experts. And getting that some form of collective wisdom um, and that support workers can have and they can that will help them and work out what's going on and improve the communication. And almost like a daily checklist, are they doing this, are they doing that? It's really, I think, quite a useful thing, particularly with people with complex physical and mental health needs. I guess the other thing that I'd be saying if I was teaching support workers is behaviour equals communication, and they're usually communicating distress, whether it's physical or mental. Um, and... If people are not understood, it usually leads to challenging behaviours, concerns, problems or distress. And I use the DIS, D-Y-S in there because it's a root that's used in a whole lot of medical things to mean difficult, like dyspnea is difficulty breathing. Um, dysesthesia is difficult, difficult feeling things. Um, there's a whole bunch of disses around the place. And this difficult stress is, a, for poor understanding, causes major problems. It also occurred to me when I, and I've seen this uh, in real life, in real life, um, that, um, yeah, i used use the example. I, I actually live next to, near or next to a uh, young man with autism spectrum disorder who's, um, who's quite, uh, he requires a lot of support. And I've, and I said to his carers, because his father's quite ill at the moment and his mother recently died, I said, um, why don't you talk to Dad and get a story about his life? Because if Dad does die, uh, there's a whole lot of stories that in his life that you may not know about. And if it carried with him this life journey, such as what was the name of the family dog, um, that 20 years later might be completely forgotten, but it was really significant to this person. And these life books, I think, are a really good idea, but that's a longer-term strategy rather than the day-to-day. Anyway, this is just a, an aside. Um, we do this. Um, one of the issues I'll talk about even further about was about the, the getting the behaviours and recording behaviours. And often support workers will come and they'll have a big volume of behavioural charts and incident charts or whatever. And you go, I'm not going to read this. I've got, you know, I used to have 50 minutes to see people, but I couldn't get through all these or make sense of them. They needed analysis. And this is a chart that was developed, in fact, by Professor Bruce Tong and Einfeld at, um, in um, who were part of one of the big world longitudinal studies of people with adolescents with intellectual disability, where you've got a kind of a, a, a summary recording of behaviours. And I particularly use this um, to get an idea of what's going on um, over a long period of time, particularly as I'm planning to decrease medications and then actually decreasing. So I've got a baseline scale and then a follow-up scale. And I just, again, I just put this together myself and you'll get a copy. Of. And I think staff have got to think, or good staff do think around these things. I wanted to talk on the further embellishment of this, and this is um, some work that we did 
uh, which was based on the understanding that, that we wanted to improve the access to care, we wanted to improve attitudes of empowerment and empower people, we wanted to enhance people's sort of story and make it accessible. Uh, the more time thing is actually around uh, Latin, the, the last topic I'll talk about, which is health assessments. But we also wanted to enhance the continuity of care and improve education and support um, and also diminish barriers. So to the other aspects of the healthcare system. Now we came up with a couple of strategies. I'm going to present the second strategy we came up first and then later on talk about, which is the Ask Diary, to try to do all of these things, but also I'll present you the CHAP, or the Comprehensive Health Assessment Program, which is a thing that's got more, is out there more and has got more scientific evidence in, in terms of its ability to change healthcare delivery. And it does all of those things. This is based upon a, a series of studies. In fact, I should put the 2016 study in there as well because there's another one. Uh, a number of, uh, we did first started off doing survey of GPs, of talking to with people with intellectual abilities and their families and psychiatrists, and um, that was interesting. Um, there was some interesting stuff from that, um, uh, including, as I, I may, had mentioned, that. 78% uh, of psychiatrists said that they often use major tranquilizers to compensate for inadequate um, community resources. So you can, this is an allusion to how complex um, major tranquilizer use is because they felt that the services were so bad that they were compensating for them. Um, but so we've done a number of randomized control trials and three of those trials, yes, um, are the largest ever done in this population in the globe, and they're all done in Queensland throughout Queensland, um, and led to changes in health policy both here and in the UK and in New Zealand and to some degree in Canada. Um, and I'll talk about a couple of the tools that we tested. This first, oh, that's the CHAP tool, as it was, and there we also developed, after doing the CHAP, and I'll come back to that, the Advocacy Skills Kit or Ask Diary, which was developed with people with disabilities and their families. It's got a thing, it really records about the person, who's your friends, who's your contacts, how do you communicate, um, what type of uh, medications do you, you know, and then all the more medical stuff, how um, and it's got ability to chart stuff. It's got a whole bunch of chart vowels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it provided kind of a health summary that they could then use in the context of the healthcare system and also provided tips and some guides to, to GPs as well. So we rigorously tested this and tested in both adults like Peter and in adolescents through the special schools and uh, in big studies. And what we found is that many found it very useful. There was some evidence that we could improve people's ability to advocate on their own behalf, and which is extraordinary. It was really the only such evidence that exists out there as far as I'm aware in the health context. Uh, not only just the health problems, but increased their knowledge of health-related health knowledge and also able to um, speak up for themselves more often if they were able to use the diary. However, we weren't able to demonstrate some, this has improved this or this has picked up this. Uh, indeed, it's a more of a long-term strategy. Despite all that, and uh, others have tried to demonstrate what we demonstrated here, the number of people have picked this idea up, and these are the diaries that are now available. Um, and my Health Matters was, to, I was involved in this, but it was involved by, subsequently developed by the Council on Intellectual Disabilities in New South Wales, and it's freely available and downloadable um, for anybody who wants to do that. In Queensland, they developed a hospital-focused uh, tool, but it's quite a good tool called Julian's Key, which is also downloadable from the Queensland Dam, um, website, which I would recommend any of these be used. And finally, the federal government, in my role as a health advisor, we developed um, on the back of work in the UK, a health companion, which is, which is saying if the person becomes acutely well, this is in the early days of the pandemic, there's essential information we need to know if they're about to enter a hospital and it records that essential information, which is kind of the key health information that uh, practitioners need to know. And that's all summarised and for readily available there. So there are a few resources there that do some of that stuff. Now I want to move on and talk about working with, uh, with just doctors working with disability services and working with doctors. And we are... Um, 
uh, not an easy group to deal with. <laughs> to say the least. Um, I'll just have a cup of coffee. Um, but I should tell you, I think that the best way that this can work is if we both understand each other's journey and how how we can and, and really deeply understand the other's journey. I have to say, when I, I worked for ten years as a GP, both in rural rural, um, I don't think I could have worked in remote areas that I remember in New Zealand and in Australia, and also in metropolitan areas. It is a very difficult job to do really well. Uh, people completely underestimate how difficult it is to do well. Um, and so they need as much help as they can. One of the key things I say to them is you need history enhancers. Now, the medical history is fundamental to me making a diagnosis. If you think about any illness that you've had or you think about something that's uh, if you don't get a clear story, it's really hard to make a diagnosis, and I can't emphasise that enough. Um, so I suggest to doctors that they uh, try to augment that history as much as possible from other people with this population. Um, and people have personal health records, and there's now a federal government uh, personal health record called My Health Record, I think. And it it is, uh, I would highly recommend doing this. I, um, I absolutely think it's a great idea. And if you ever get sick, particularly when you're away from family and friends and not in a place where, and you get acutely sick, uh, boy, will that be handy to you. I've been in situations in emergency department where somebody's come in and we have no history and they're unconscious. And to know that that person has or doesn't have diabetes, know that they have or don't have epilepsy, know or don't or don't know that they have a, had previously had a cancer of a particular type was absolutely fundamental to what we did from that point and we had nothing and um, it made it very difficult. So having this uh, My Health Record accessible, which it will be, and being part of it from our point of view and getting good care is, I think, crucial and, um, and I've joined up. <laughs> uh, so... I, I tell doctors they need to give themselves a chance because, and that's about review, 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 and also produce a diagnostic formulation of what you think is going on. Um, and if you think that the care that the person is getting and you think the care they're getting is poor, talk to the senior management of the organisation, be an advocate. Um, it's not uncommon, and I've seen it many times now, where support staff, as well as doctors and other people, abusing people and not doing the right thing. Um, I also encourage them to actually be more aggressive in investigations because if you don't have a story, then sometimes you've got to do things like, is this person constipated? I can't tell. Maybe we should do an abdominal X-ray and find out because it can be life-threatening. And finally, I'd say to you and that I think that they should limit not to see too many people that are complex um, and it can be in a major stress for them. Um, if they do. Anyway, it's maybe a little bit controversial. For support staff and your support staff, I'd say that you need to, and not just oh, I say, you build a relationship with your GP. I worked as a, um, a locum in New Zealand in this fantastic practice, and the GP went away for three months and I looked after his uh, practice, which was 1,500 patients. And um, Rob came back and he, and he said to me, I said to him, look, there's three people I'm really worried about, Rob. And he said, don't tell me who they are. And I thought, you're going mad. <laughs> Why wouldn't I tell you who they are? He said, because I'll tell you who they are. And he was right. Three people, he meant he'd been in this place for 15 years. He knew well enough who, because he knew the people he was dealing with, all this information was stored in his head. And he picked one, two, three that I was concerned about. Amazing, I thought. So building relationships gives you this continuity. Um, and if you can, and this is not necessarily easy, but if you can find a, a practitioner who you personally or your client shares kind of a commonality together and you can work collaboratively in health, then it certainly can make a huge difference. And there's even research about improving continuity care leads to better care and, and doctors going the extra mile. I think it's really important that staff understand the pressures of practice as well. Because what... What people don't realise is if you come in and see somebody in general practice, it might be a really busy day. You might have somebody in the back room on an asthma pump. You may be worried about somebody's 
in another setting, it can be a whole lot of confounding factors. So going back and trying to understand and negotiate with the practice is really, really essential. And I can't emphasise that enough if you want good care. It's also essential for support workers to do, to provide clear, accurate information. Um, and of when, why, how, what happened about the person's symptoms and, and also for a consistent message be provided by the disability support staff that they all agree on a group on a particularly about what's actually happening and we don't have splitting of different opinions and uh, people acting out between the staff. Um, and finally, I mean, I also, and I'll talk a bit more about this, providing some education to the GP and that sounds a little bit controversial, but I'll come back to it. There's a whole bunch of things that people can do to prepare for the consultation. It may be, this may be very simple if you look down this list of things like writing down your question, take the medications. But believe me, many, many, many times I've been in consultations where the support workers know nothing or very little about the person they've just brought along. It's almost useless if I don't have some of this information. Um, and in fact, it makes it used to make me feel very angry when people would come along. Um, often may not have been that fault, of course, they may have been dropped into it, um, but it's a real problem if they don't know um, a good detailed story. So providing accessible information, I've talked about charts and letters and diaries, so we've talked around that stuff. Um, and I just to emphasise this, if you look at this, this is when you come in to see your GP, what you lot, what you find us often doing is sitting down and looking at the screen now, used to be the notes, and looking for the health summary to orient ourselves. And what we're orienting ourselves is the really important thing. Like if I scan myself down here, that's really important. That's pretty important. That's not so important. That may be important. That's certainly important. That's definitely important. <laughs> so, you know, you know, you kind of what are the big ticket items here uh, in terms of, uh, and you can see constipation and diabetes. There's a story here. So often you need this summary. You see, you'd have to flick down and see if there's any major diagnosis because one of the jobs actually as a GP is to try to work out if there's anything major going on like now that's going to damage my patient sitting in front of me. And so summary information is really useful and it has to be summary because there's a limited time. Um, I've also written down, in fact, what are the asking questions, and I understand this is very difficult, and these of GPs. So some of the questions you want to ask professionals, and I've got a list here, and the next, these questions were actually not developed by me. They were developed by Olive Webb, who is the former president of ACID and a New Zealand psychologist that worked, did some brilliant work and still doing brilliant work in New Zealand about what to ask doctors. Um, what do you think's wrong is an obvious question, and you know, give this to your staff. These are the obvious questions, and sometimes it's useful if, when you're facing power to have questions in your hand to ask. And if they don't know, what are the possibilities? Because if you come in with something, and it's not uncommon that it's vague, the hypothesis is that it might be this, and th this will be sorted out by doing a test, spending time, trying a treatment, um, yeah, often time actually sorts it out, particularly in general practice. So what is it and what are the other possibilities? And what other things could that support staff do to help tease out their diagnosis? And it might be as simple as go back and find out from the family what's going on or go and have a look in the notes or send me a copy of the medications or, um, uh, you know, there's a whole... Often, you know, there's a, I've, I've been in situations where people have completely lost massive information, really important information, all makes sense and leads me down a different path. I've also been in a situation where somebody has presented with very strange behaviours that we couldn't explain. It was only over the course of about uh, 18 months was it clearly, it was clearly this person was psychotic. So sometimes time is the most useful thing you have in in medical practice because it's things that reveal themselves that are not obvious necessarily beforehand. So if the doctor's proposing further examinations and investigations, what are the risks versus the benefits? And uh, I think particularly with COVID and the vaccine, in the middle of the vaccine rollout, we're all thinking about risks versus benefits in this equation. 
And, and it's an important question. Um, I think, yeah. Uh, and will they alter, if you do this examination or investigations, how will it contribute to the person's well-being? Will it actually alter their management? It's a really good test. Um, because if it's not going to really help the management, then you've got to ask everything that anybody does to you has got some risk associated with it. Um, uh, but sometimes the risk can be, uh, or the benefits can be to somebody else. For example, if I had a genetic condition, and I probably do, I just don't know about it, um, that was important for my family, then I'd probably have the genetic test done, even though I didn't actually influence my health care. So there may be things as subtle as that. But other things are... Um, may be important for other reasons. I have a question to ask about medication. Uh, again, the risk benefit. Oh, wait a minute. I, oh, no. okay. I need to go backwards. Getting a bit confused here. Yeah, medications. So once you get to medications, what are the risks and benefits? And there's certainly, as I put in the second bottle point, sometimes side effects, they're not compulsory. And... Um, Sometimes placebo produces as many side effects, and there's one particular drug I saw a review of where um, the placebo was producing much more coughing than the drug itself um, was one of the anti. So, but it's also recognised that people with disabilities are going to we're going to easily miss um, uh, if people have got problems with communication, as I described with the anti-epileptic drugs. How will you know whether it worked? It's a really good question. Um, and I have to say, after years of practice, sometimes um, inactivity actually works very well, I think. <laughs> Just resting and taking your time to rest actually works. And it may, and how do you know that this particular strategy worked? It's a really complex and sounds simple, but looking for clear markers that suggest that it's actually improved people. Um, and when will it be reviewed and what information do they need to have available? Uh, and the other ethical question, I think, is in the assessment of management, is this treatment different than the general population? And there has been times when, particularly in management of cardiac problems, but also cancers, where we've seen when you look at the treatments being offered by a specialist and you go, really, would have they done this with somebody who was not ahead in disability? And putting that test as to is this an appropriate situation, decision, um, and is this being done because the, the assessment of the specialist is that it's not worth it and the person's of less value um, and they won't offer the treatment. So sometimes treatment is worth hell because of that and even investigations, and I've seen some particularly disturbing situations of this, um, and that's something that staff need to think about. Uh, and finally, and I guess this is the Friday afternoon stream, what if the post strategy doesn't work? Um, and what do we do after hours? Really good questions. Um, and, they, and staff need to ask those questions and get some clarity around this. And if they are going to do other things after hours, well, what are they going to do? And how do they just make that decision to do those things? Okay. Now, just briefly on some of the further supports for GP. Sounds very strange, but... Um, uh, I think, it, you know, the population are quite challenging for GPs and I think the best way is, even though some of them are not great to work with, that's usually out of um, their uncertainty, I think, often. Um, um, information about syndromes. There is a really unusual rare syndromes, some of which I've seen that I don't carry the information around in my head. And it can, if you're caring for somebody with a, an unusual syndrome that might be one in 40,000, one in 20,000. Um, I care for a man with Lesh 9 syndrome. And gee, the prevalence of that is uh, vanishingly rare. Um, and it's really useful to have a summary. I used to have, I think I had a, for Michael, I think I had a summary in my, my chart of saying these are the associations in this follow, and it's really useful. And sometimes you can get this from the, the association websites or other sites, such as the, um, um, what's it called? Mm, ND, uh, not the NDS. Um, you know, there's places where you can find this information and give it to the doctor. Um, do the follow-up reviews I've, been, I've mentioned. Uh, 
try to share common goals of maximising healthcare to you and your child, your, um, and share your desire and share their desire to support the practitioner to do it. And sometimes, particularly, I think uh, having a practice nurse in this mix is actually a really useful thing to do. Just finally, before I have to leave this, there is a series of books with a group of us to develop. It's a whole of life guide. Uh, and it's designed, we originally designed it to be read for people with intellectual disability, read by families, carers, and everybody else. And it was in a book form, and that's a picture of the version three book. The version four has just been released electronically. And you will probably not know, but the ETG is a the therapeutic guidelines books are uh, known to all doctors and all health staff generally. They are a quick access guide to care. And the the Developmental Disability Guidelines have just come out, the updated version that myself and many other people around Australia have worked on, and is now almost certainly the doctor will have this on their, their website, and this is the kind of the page of them. So they've actually got up-to-date information about what you need to do, and you can see the latest revised edition of the Developmental Disability and Psychotropic Guidelines, so up-to-date information on that. These guidelines are not funded by drug companies, are not funded by by um, governments, they are completely independent. In fact, uh, doctors and other people, health people, fight to become on the advisory panels because they're so highly regarded. So there's actually a there's a whole there's antibiotic guidelines, there's gastrointestinal guidelines, cardiovascular, skin, blah blah blah. They're all electronic. In fact, I don't know if you can actually see me, but I can actually I've got it on my mobile phone, and I can just check it, and you'll see doctors doing stuff like that. From time to time. So it's a useful resource to know that it's actually out there. The other resource is the uh, Able X series. And um, let's just have a check the time. The Able X series um, is a online course that's available to you and staff. It, it's a collaboration of a number of universities. I think it's about 13 universities around the globe to produce massive open online courses. That's the MOOC up the top there. And included in that group are University of Queensland, but also Harvard, uh, MIT, uh, University of Berkeley, California, and University of Toronto, all over the globe. And they're all online. And not just uh, they we went around the globe and interviewed people and did three of them. And I'll just uh, if this works, let's see if this works. We'll give it a go. Eh? I don't know if it'll work. We'll give it a go. Did you actually attend the MOOC yourself, Nick? People with intellectual disability. Well, I actually I did it. Okay. You see, and can you see that, all right? That are often undiagnosed and poorly. No, can no we can't, unfortunately. We can oh. hear it, we just can't see it. Oh, okay, that's pretty. Evo. That's pretty. Okay, I'll, I'll stop it. We I'll try to stop it anyway. Health issues <laughs> with people themselves, their families, disability organisations, health professionals, and academics in the field. The physical. Okay. So this was, um, there's three aspects. One's on speak up, but people talking about their experience of health, and that's the first MOOC. Um, then there's Well and Able, which is about physical health care, and then Able Minded, which is about physical mental health care. And people can do this. I interviewed people around the globe, um, experts in the area, ranging from um, uh, Eric Emerson right through to psychiatrists in the UK who work in the area and about how they treat. So this is available. And the other side of this, and and I'll say you can audit it for free. The, all the videos, you can actually, are Creative Commons, so you can download them and use them in your course for free. You can pitch them, <laughs> which is amazing. And it's still running five years later. Um, so, yeah, that's a, that's a resource I thought I should alert you to because uh, it's quite unique. The, um, I'm going to talk about what we've got the most evidence of improving the health of people with intellectual disability. And this is particularly intellectual disability. And there are evidences around adults with intellectual disability and, and, um, and uh, adolescents with intellectual disability. And I showed you this slide before. Um, and it was really the big, not the beginning, but kind of uh, almost the beginning after doing this wide consultation of surveys. I did a survey of a thousand GPs back and found, uh, got their opinions about what would help them. And we got, uh, you know, a pretty reasonable response rate. And uh, 
really, you know, they, um, you know, that they, they, they really um, were, some of them were even uncertain who we were talking about when we referred to intellectual disability. They, but they, there was one of the interesting things was that people would say it's all about money, but it actually wasn't when we asked them. It was, it was really that it's difficult and that staff change all the time and the story changes, you know, the, the history changes and it can be slower. Um, they, you know, they, um, you know, they, they, they didn't find it easy, but they, and they also get excluded GPs in, in early childhood because people go and see the pediatrician and they don't see the GP, so they don't build this relationship. And psychiatrists, as I said, um, you know, they, they found it enormously challenging as well. And in fact, 39% um, of the psychiatrists said personally they prefer not to treat this population in one of the surveys we did. Um, and that was uh, pretty startling. So to try to get some traction, we developed these tools, and I've talked about the ASTRO, but the primary one, the first one we did was the Comprehensive Health Assessment Program. Because if you've got all these unmet health needs, you've got problems with access, you've got problems with the health story, you've got problems with poorly trained staff, doctors not knowing about the specifics of this population, and, uh, um, and also this disintegration and disconnect and lack of coordination between health and disability supporters. This was a, an approach that had worked in the elderly, and the elderly have a lot of similar types of illnesses as people with disabilities. And there was a body of literature in the UK that suggested, and elsewhere, and Europe, that suggested health assessments were really useful in the elderly. So we particularly went around the health assessment thing, and that's why I spent most of my career working on this. And, um, and it was to do all those things I've mentioned to, to improve access, to empower people, health story, more time, continuity, improve continuity and support and educate and the demolish barriers to the rest of the healthcare system. So they were the enablers we were trying to enable. This is a, uh, there's now version 21, so this is an old version, but it's the best slide I've got of the chap and the original paper that changed health policy. Um, curiously enough, this paper was actually sent to um, Tony Abbott when he was the health minister. I faxed it to his uh, home fax, believe it or not, and Tony rang up the head of the health department and said, we should do this, and a couple of years later, they produced a Medicare item. So much to my, I'm not a great political fan of Tony Abbott, but uh, he, made, uh, he made my career in this regard, <laughs> so, which is kind of irony. Um, anyway, so, and the reason for that is because I think it's a can-do. You can do this, and it's deliverable, and in fact, we know it's revenue neutral, aren't you? Yeah, overall, as far as, as far as we can tell. So it gives access to going to the GP and it gives access to going to the GP when, um, when it's not, not focused on a complaint, but it's a, an overall review. And this is filled out by the person with disability, their family, carers, and there's a whole bunch of questions which the GP can then flick through and ask supplementary questions, or the practice nurse can flick through and ask supplementary questions. It then says to the GP, but also the support staff, and I've seen this word, these are the common things that are missed in this population or poorly managed. Now, the way medicine works, we don't like missing stuff. And um, so this is a real kind of prompt to them go, oh, what have I screwed up here, um, <laughs> quietly. Um, but also I've seen this in the trialling. I saw one of the uh, uh, support staff pick this up when I was getting to review the compre how, comprehens how comprehensible the, the language was uh, as part of that trialling. And uh, the person picked it up and went, oh, I think Terry's got that. Oh, I think Terry's got that. And it endorses them to say this is credible information because it comes from a university and, um, and is actually based on the literature and I can direct you to papers uh, that'll, show, that'll highlight the points of all of these, these issues. Um, and at that time, there was a specific Medicare item to do it, um, 718, 719. There's now a, a group of cluster of items. So it does that. So it actually improves advocacy. It improves the knowledge of GPs at the time when they actually need it, like when they're seeing the patient. You know, we see lots of different people. But to actually have information reinforced when you actually need it is the best way to learn. 
and that's what it does. It then gets the the doctor or the practice nurse to review a whole bunch of things, and I haven't, um, and prompts them and says. In the, sorry, in this segment, it actually there's other bits that say, have you thought about the cause of the disability? Have you thought about their mobility? Have you thought about whether their ears are full of wax? Have you tested their hearing? Have you tested their vision? Um, have you done a whole, you know, all those things that, that you, you know, that it was just, have you checked their immunisation, for example? Um, yeah, have you talked about their diet at all? So, and, and it has little things like, um, if they haven't been tested for a cause of disability for five years and the cause remains unknown, maybe that needs to be revisited because the technology is changing massively here. Um, and lots of doctors won't know that stuff. And then it brings, it tries to get the GP to fill out what are the problems and then what actions are taken and when they're going to come back. And in fact, um, and and then it's it's signed off and it's to say, and there's an agreement between the, the provider and the disability disability provider and the GP, these are the things we're going to do and you're going to come back and we'll check into it. And finally, it has syndrome-specific conditions. And this is deliberately designed for doctors. Doctors love this bit because it makes them feel empowered. It has beautiful medical words like rhabdomyosarcoma in it and things like that that they love saying and know that it's their language and theirs only. Um, I'm being facetious, but you know it, it's it's actually quite a useful checklist to think about for doctors to think about. So that's what the chap does, and that's uh, when we did this, and this is throughout Queensland, so it's uh, definitely up in Cairns and Atherton, in fact, and all over the place. Um, uh, this is the basic methodology of a randomised clustered. It's actually the full name is a pragmatic clustered complex randomised control trial because it was in the real world. It was done uh, with gathering a lot of qualitative data about people's experience and people and the structure had to be clustered to make sure we didn't get contamination between the two groups. So one group had the CHAP, the other group had usual care, and then they got the CHAP at the end of the year. And we saw what effect the CHAP had. Um, I'll come back to some of that, yeah. The overall findings is we got to up to 30 times increase in various health actions like vision and hearing testings, women's health screening, immunisations, and also new diagnosis like reflux esophagitis, which is called diabetes, epilepsy, picta. We also then, and that was comparing the GP's notes between the GP's where they'd had it, the GP's notes where they hadn't had it. But then when we looked at actually the GP's had also written in the actual chat booklet, and the, the, well, this comparison, the strict scientific comparison, was probably a massive underestimate of the strength of the change in terms of healthcare delivery. So it's on the back of this research and then subsequently two more studies, we got a change in health policy and a Medicare item in Australia and why the CHAP is the only tool that's been tested in the Australian healthcare system um, and the most rigorously tested tool globally. The other thing, as I said, is we talked to... Um, um, we talked to everybody involved in this, people with intellectual disabilities, and they couldn't identify anything different from any other consultation. Um, I think we should have talked immediately as they walked out the door because the recall was a problem. Um, but we also talked to the GPs and we talked to carers and support support workers largely found it acceptable. In fact, they made the report that actually enhanced the quality of the relationship, not just in this study, but in other studies, and trust between them and the healthcare provider, um, but also the trust between the client and the healthcare provider because they got a good bit used to each other, particularly during a, when we used it in deinstitutionalisation. Um, and that... The GPs reported they felt a bit more confident with the, with the staff but learning more, and the GPs said things like, I was missing things, now looking at more closely and more particularly. The chap provides a reassurance that I'm doing the right thing and on track to care for my patients. I'm taking a more positive approach to picking up and recognising medical problems. The, 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 the one of the GPs I presented, I, there was a GP in Ipswich near, um, near where I live, but that I presented at their breakfast meeting once. And he, I knew this guy was a really good GP. He was also, I knew, a father of a child with an adult child with intellectual disability. And he looked me in the eye as they do, and he said, Nick, I thought this was all bullshit. And then I kept finding stuff. 
<laughs> so, um, and that's kind of reassuring. There's about a 5% of GPs that really don't like any bureaucracy or anything to do it, and that was the number we got. And um, People will say GPs don't want to do it because it's too long. Well, actually, the study shows about 5%. Um, and, um, and here is the other thing, and that's why I've got the green love heart uh, up here, is that in most studies of this type, we recruit 10% of people, whether they're people into the study, we got 71% of people with intellectual disability recruited and 91% of GPs. This is a remarkable result. And that's because when you interview GPs, they, because of the way we recruited, basically we recruited people with intellectual disabilities, then we contacted the GPs and said, your patients want to be involved in this. And they said, yeah, okay, we'll do it. Um, and it's because they have a relationship with that person over a long time. And that's why the relationship stuff is really important in relationship with the practice. So promoting and embedding that relationship means that the GPs will go the extra mile and do this type of stuff. It was costing them time and money. Um, I, I went up the state talking to GPs and I always remember the GP. I thought they'd be all nice female doctors, not middle-aged um, doctors like me, male doctors, but they're all middle-aged male doctors mainly uh, who were seeing quite large numbers of people. And they and one GP and Mackay said to me, Nick, you know, when the bus arrives, on my heart sinks because I know I'm going to be behind. But you know, they're my guys. I want to do the best for them, and that's all about relationship and love. Um, and I've presented this internationally, with the title of the presentation being "Love in the Time of Randomised Control Trials," because I thought that was quite amusing. Um, now. The limitations are we have no evidence for any of these tools in terms of long-term effect. And this is not uncommon in a lot of research um, and is a problem in cancer research, in fact, because you can't follow people for long enough to get this evidence and certainly it's not been followed. Um, we don't know that it decreases do, do, do people dying. We just know we pick up stuff. And I guess one of the joys of my life, even now that I'm in, even when I'm not in clinical practice, is I occasionally I hear about most recently somebody who had a melanoma picked up because they had a chap done. And I've certainly seen lymphomas and breast cancers and other things picked up because they had a chap done. And that seems even more rewarding than having numbers that I can quote. Um, it's cost neutral um, as far as we can tell. The main problem with this, me talking about this, is that I am considered the university at the end of the study I pointed out that they now own this and they found anything that I think at times they own and so they've commercialised it. And normally the state governments have got a licence and I honestly can't remember whether the Queensland government's still got a current licence. I've tried to work that out and I contacted them around midday to find out but I um, haven't got a reply. Uh, access to the CHAP is via the Unicrest eShop um, and it also has on the website, and that's a top part of the website here, um, it has a couple of videos, and particularly Karen, um, who used to work at Centre Care. I think she still works in Centre Care. In fact, I think she's in Mackay now. No, in Gladstone. Um, she's talking about how they implement it across their service. There's also me talking about why I do it and some information about that. So it can be purchased individually, and organisations certainly licensed to use. There is currently significant work happening in the federal sphere to try to make it increasingly accessible, but I can't, I don't know the outcomes of those things because it depends on budgetary processes and other things. But certainly the, the Royal Disability Royal Commission um, on violence and neglect and uh, the federal government in their development of their healthcare um, roadmap have picked up as this is the most, uh, as a front and centre of an approach to augment the capacity of us to staff to deliver the CHAM. Um, and just don't believe my research has been reviewed by some of the best people in the world, particularly the men. I think I mentioned Eric Emerson down the bottom here. Here's young Eric. Um, health checks consistently lead to detection of unmet health needs, target actions to address health needs. Health checks also have the potential to increase knowledge of health needs of people with intellectual disability. And I think this, I think this is a really good educational strategy because you people know how difficult it is to, to educate people just talking like I'm doing to you. But if practitioners are using it day to day in their practice, whether there's disability practitioners, or medical practitioners, it gets embedded into the practice and affects other things. They come to see another place and they go, oh, maybe I should think about this. That's how we learn best by actually doing it. Um, and it, as I said, it's I recognise unrecognised health needs. 
including life-threatening conditions. So, um, and indeed, many will remember the tragedy of Anne Marie Smith, um, who died in South Australia, um, and her interim report identified as safeguarding number one, regular health checks need to be available to all vulnerable NDIS participants. And in fact, I lobbied the NDIS for them to license the CHAP tool, but they refused to do it. Um, and um, if this woman had had a health check and, so, and somebody walked in and actually had a good look at her, you'd have to say she probably wouldn't have died. Okay, so uh, this is just a Somerset Mourn quote. It's a funny thing about life. If you refuse to accept anything but the best, that's what you often get. Um, and I think that's really true. So in conclusion, um, there's many strategies to avoid death, disease and neglect in this population and the people you're teaching are key resources in this. Um, and I can't emphasize enough the knowing the person in detail, the person you support in detail, really crucial. Um, anybody that's supported anybody who's vulnerable will know how important that is and how easy things can be missed or poorly done if you don't need to know somebody in detail. Actively do health promotion. Actively monitor key health issues. Advocate well in the health system. Use the various tools and make some um, and educate and support people with disabilities, the parents and disability support staff and health care providers is also fundamental. So I've got a question for you. There you go. Um, what, if anything, will this change uh, in what you do in, in, in the teaching? I'd like you to take a few moments to reflect on that and share in the chat or verbally as to how you think, because I, you know, I um, not uncommonly do presentations like this, and I think that it's really, it's one thing for me to talk about these things, but it's really important that I really would learn a lot to know how you can possibly embed and what's useful to you. And uh, if we were doing this in a room, I would have done this in groups. Um, so I wonder if people can do that. And I will stop sharing the screen at this point. <laughs>